Raffles by E. W. Horner, a series of short stories dramatized for radio by Olwyn Weimark, with Jeremy Clyde as Raffles and Michael Cochran as Bunny. No Sinecure. Early morning in the Holloway Road. It was the year of the Diamond Jubilee, but I had little to celebrate. The sun was already forcing its way through the dirty windows of my cramped, untidy attic room. It was going to be a hot day. I sat at the rickety little table, the remains of my meagre breakfast pushed aside, trying to work. A series of articles being printed in a philanthropical daily. The subject... Reflections on prison life. My own. Pull yourself together, man. At least you're alive. Raffles was dead. A.J. Raffles, my dearest friend in the world and my partner in crime. That last image of him will be burned into my memory forever. We were on the German liner Vulcan between Genoa and Naples, Inspector Mackenzie of Scotland Yard, disguised, had followed us on board and arrested us. Then, Raffles' sudden leap onto the ship's railing. I saw his hands shoot up and clasp together. Before anyone could move, the swift, plunging dive against the blazing sunset and into the sea below. Your man is gone, Inspector. One of them, I... I might have known we'd never get him into a jail. He preferred the gentleman's way out. What do you mean? He can swim? I fear your friend has no hope, young man. We are a dozen miles from them. And the currents around here are notorious. Aye, they're muckle dangerous, it said. Come away, Mr. Manders. We've seen the last of A.J. Raffles. They took me and locked me in the brig. A small barred porthole looked out to sea. For many hours I watched while the ship hove to and boats were put out to search for my friend. As the sun sank behind the island of Elba... Telegram for you. What was that? Telegram. Oh, uh, thanks. I ain't had no rent off you this week, you know. You'll get it. See Mr. Maturin's advertisement daily. What? Ah, see Mr. Maturin's advertisement daily mail. Might suit, beg, try, will speak if necessary. Not signed. Who on earth? Veer Street, May the 11th, 1897. Good God, Cousin Neville. But how could it be he? My eminent kinsman, complete with OBE, who not a month since had had me brutally turned out of his house when I had the temerity to call. I was a disgrace to the family. I'd made my bed, could go and live and die on it, etc., etc. And now? Prepare to speak for me for some kind of post. I mustn't waste time. A wash, a quick shave, pawn shop for my suit, oh, and buy a daily mail. Uh, third floor, sir. Thank you. No lift, I see. Oh, come along. This is Earl's Court, not Mayfair. Oh, so oh, sorry. <laughs> come about that job? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> You'll be lucky. I couldn't even get past the doctor. Number 29, I presume? I, I beg your pardon? The 29th applicant today. Is this Mr. Maturin? Maturin, Maturin. Yes, yes, yes. Come in. Dr. Theobald, a man not much older than myself. Impeccable frock coat, high colour, moustache, a monocle. Excellent. That's one of the public schools on his list of acceptables. He's not an easy man to please, and a colonial into the bargain. Believe me, if you get the billet, it'll be no sinecure. Uh, by the way, what's your name? Ma- Ma- Manchester. Through here, Mr. Manchester. So 
Well, you think you could look after me, do you? I'm certain I could, sir. Single-handed, mind. I don't keep another soul. You'd have to cook your own grub and my slops. The reek of drugs and disinfectants was stifling. The room was darkened, but a chink from an ill-fitting blind glimmered on the gaunt white face on the pillow. Any experience? Well, uh, Speak uh, up, uh, man. Done this kind of thing before? Uh, no, sir. Then what the devil makes you so certain you can do it now, eh? I only meant I, I, I would uh, uh, do my best. Done your best at everything else, then? I... No, I have not. <laughs> you do well to own it. You do well, sir. Well, indeed. Not a varsity man, eh? No. What did you do when you left school? I came into money. And then? I spent it. And since then? Since then, I say? Uh, a, a relative of mine will uh, tell you if you ask him. He, he has uh, promised to speak for me. I would rather say no more myself. But you shall, sir. But you shall. A public schoolboy apply for a berth like this? Not unless something or other had dragged him down a bit. Think I'm a fool? Dr. Theobald. Uh, yes, Mr. Matcher, and I'll, I'll show Mr. Magister out. No, confound you. Show yourself out. Clear out, I said. This man may do or may not, but I don't need you here to make up my mind. But... Get out. 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 No, yes, Mr. Matcher. No sinecure indeed. Did I really want to be cooped up day and night with this hysterical despot? And damn good riddance, eh? The man's a complete tyrant. I can't call me sell me own. Watches me like a hawk, won't even let me smoke. You'll find the cigarettes tucked behind that very indifferent Rossetti print. What? Oh, uh, yes, I, um, uh, this one. Uh, that's it. Uh, here you are. Thanks. And, uh, now a light. Oh. Go on, take one yourself. May I? The porter smuggles them in for me. I've smoked worse. But not like a Sullivan, eh, Bunny? What? Huh? What did you say? Who are you? Can't you guess? But it's impossible. Oh, Bunny. <laughs> Raffles! I cannot repeat what I said. I have no idea what I did. I only know, I only knew, that it was A.J. Raffles in the flesh. I was the very devil of a swim, Bunny, but oh. I defy you or anybody else to sink in the Mediterranean. The sunset saved me. Oh. The sea was like a blazing fire and they couldn't spot me. Oh. Uh, quite a long haul to Elba, though. There were moments, I don't mind admitting, when I thought I... Uh... Here I am now, eh? Oh, my <laughs> dear chap, I, 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 I can't believe it. It's, it's like a... <clears throat> I, I must have a good look at you before we say another word. Oh, have I changed so much then, Bunny? Your hair, it's gone quite white. And just so thin. Raffles. You really are ill, aren't you? Ill? Oh, my dear fellow, I'm dead. I'm at the bottom of the sea, and don't you forget it. But surely... Oh, yes, I realise there's a last-leg look about me. But that's from all this lying in bed in the dark. Oh. And being categorically forbidden solid food. And being half-poisoned by Theobald's blasted prescriptions. But I don't understand. But why have a doctor at all if you're not ill? Why on earth lie in bed if you haven't got to? Because it's a damn sight better than lying in jail. As you know only too well, my dear friend. Ah, oh, Bunny, if you knew oh, how Oh, don't, Edge, I... please, please, don't. Is he a quack, this Theobald fellow? And doesn't he guess that there's nothing wrong with him? Knows, bless you. But he doesn't know I know he knows. But I'm a fat income to him. He's going to marry on the profits he makes on me. That telegram. You had something to do with it, didn't you? No more than composing and sending it. You owe... <laughs> My memories of the stout cousin Neville still fit, eh? Like a dove. But how did you find me? Oh, I spotted you at once from those prison articles. 
Not signed, of course, but the fist was the fist of my sitting rabbit. Yes, but who gave you my address? Your editor. I visited his offices in the dead of night. Huh? Oh, yes, I occasionally go afield like other ghosts, you know. Yes, I wheedled it out of him in five minutes, knowing your name, you see. I, your only living relative, long lost, desperate to find you. But why all the complication and uh, subterfuge? There are two of me now, Bunny. One's at the bottom of the Mediterranean, and one's an old Australian desirous of dying in the mother country. The only person he knows in London is his doctor. He's got to be consistent or he's done. Begin to see? Yes, of course I do, AJ. I'm a fool. But, oh, what a devilish dull life for you. Oh, not now you've come, my dear rabbit. <laughs> now then, uh, back you go to your garret and get your things. Uh, how much will square you up there? Uh, oh, uh, a tenner easily. I had one ready for you. Oh, and get me a stall for the Lyceum tonight at the nearest agents. The Lyceum? Uh, why? For the good Dr. Theobald. When you come back, tell him someone gave it to you. And then, when he's out of the way, what say you to supper at Kellner's? The staff's all new there, I've discovered. We'll celebrate. This way, Bunny. We must get from our roof to the one next door, you see, over this little bridge. We have an excellent fire escape right down to the street. Most convenient for ghosts. <laughs> uh, careful. Not too close to the parapet. Oh, it's a sheer drop. Oh, hold on to this rail. That's it. And now, across to there... Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention we're from the wild and woolly west, so talk like a stage American. What? I can't possibly. Well, then keep mum and leave it to me. Hey, you! May I help you, gentlemen? Uh, you sure can. Takes up one of your little old private rooms. I made a reservation for it last night. Jumping, gee, Hossafat. Here, I'll pour that, friend. You, you just hustle right along, bring us up our fiddles. <laughs> Yes, sir. I think I prefer your Australian. Well, if you can do better. No, 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 no. Mm. Paul Roger, 84. Uh, it's a long time since you and I cracked a bottle of this. A long time, Raffles. A long, long time. Well, here's to now. The old team, back to work. When you say back to work, Raffles... Mm, well, the work that you and I know best, Bunny. What else? Crime, you mean? I prefer to think of it as adventure. Yes, you always did. Bunny. Hmm? I must have the straight truth from you. Are you game? Yes. Yes, I am. Good man. <laughs> Six months ago, I'd have said no. I swear I've done my honest best since my reappearance in the world, Raffles, but the, the world seems determined to do its worst by me. So, lead on the dance. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> well, gee willikers, didn't I tell you? Your Chateau Margot, sir. Can you beat it? I had an aunt called Margot. <laughs> Put her down there, son. Uh, my, 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 my partner here was saying this is one humdinger of a meal. Ain't that right, partner? What? Yes, um, dang tootin'. <laughs> Very kind, sir. Have a care, Bunny. I don't want you tripping over that parapet into eternity. Oh, don't worry about me, old chap. Nothing to it. <laughs> oh, 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 I've got you. Here. Uh, let's um, sit down for a last cigarette. Oh, no lights on in the ground floor, so our medico's still out. We smoked in companionable silence up there between the chimney stacks and the stars. Full of good food and excellent wine, reunited with the dearest friend I had, who until today I thought I'd lost forever, I felt a golden glow of contentment. I was quite startled when he broke the silence. Gold. Huh? What's that? Gold. That's what we need. Gold can be melted down into nuggets and paid for in hard cash across the counter in the Bank of England. Yes, that's it's true. Jewellery is simply not worth the effort. Do you remember that first little crib we cracked together? A couple of thousand that stuff was worth. Easily. 
but a few hundreds of what we got. No, oh, by God, I'm done with fences forever. <sighs> Me too. Heard of the Room of Gold at the British Museum? Hmm? No, no, I can't say I... What? British Museum? You don't mean you'd... A free admission, Bunny. Good deal simpler than drain pipes and rope ladders. <laughs> That's as may be, but the place is alive. That it... room is positively stuffed with gold. Old vases and ewers and coins, and there's one really exquisite piece. A gold cup worth thousands. Oh, Raffles, be reasonable. I mean, surely Here even you Hang on. Get... What's that? What's oh, the good doctor? Now, quick, money. Move like the wind down those back stairs and into our beds before he gets up there for his late night checkup. What? Who's that? Answer me. Who's that sneaking in here? Only me, Mr. Maturin. Only? Do you want me to have heart failure? Is that what you're after, you damn fool? Now, now, you know I always look in last thing. There's no more need for that. This fellow Manchester's bunked down in the corner. Oh. Are you there, Manchester? Hey, hey. I, I'm here. Sir, I'm here, sir. I'm here, sir. As for you, Theobald... And I have enough trouble sleeping without you skulking about. Yes, but... He'll come and get you if you're needed, which you won't be. Ah, uh, you can't be too sure of have a satisfaction. Have I ever needed you at night? Not once, never. So get back down to your own quarters and stay there. Well, if you're really... Now! So, uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, good night, Mr. Maturin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do believe you enjoy all that ranting, AJ. Eh, oh, thoroughly. It's frightfully cathartic. It only makes him congratulate himself on restoring my energy. Up you get. We've got to get out of these duds. <laughs> Lucky he didn't switch on the light. I've still got my hat on. <laughs> <laughs> the matrimonial knot gets tied next week and he'll be off on his honeymoon. Now, the day after he goes, you can bribe the porter and tell him I'm pining for fresh air. We'll hire one of those invalid carrying chairs from Harrods to get me down the stairs. Where are we going? Kew Gardens. Ah, oh, right here. Yeah. And then we'll double back to the British Museum. Uh, now, Raffles. Uh, just for a reconnoiter, Bunny. What do you say? Well, as long as that's all it is. There he is. Here goes, sir. Lift your end for the turn. Yes, yeah, it's all right. Confound it, you're jostling me. I won't be jostled. Well, that's all right, sir. Don't you upset yourself. Here we are. Uh, now then, uh, you take his other arm, sir. Yes. Oh, out we get. Into the cab. Oh, watch what you're doing. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, easy does it, sir. Well... Uh, there we are. Now, uh, will you be taking this contraption with you, uh, Mr. Manchester? Huh? Oh, yes, I suppose we will. No, we won't. They've got bath chairs for hire at Kew. Use your head, man. Sorry, sir. Well, I'll uh, stow it in the hall then, sir. You've got a lovely hot day for your outing. Put the bath chair over by that bench, Bunny. Right up. And now, quick march out the other entrance. We want to get there when the museum opens, before the crowds. Tuppany guide, please. There we are, sir. Thank you. Now, let's see. Oh, yes, here it is. Room 43. Uh, how do we know we won't see anybody who'll recognize us? Have we ever known anybody who'd be in the British Museum at 10 in the morning? Come on, up those stairs. I was frankly disappointed in the so-called room of gold. We were quite obviously wasting our time. Nothing I saw in the glass cases looked anything but dilapidated and flimsy. And the biggest fraud of all was the very cup Raffles had mentioned. Why, it's as thin as paper. Quite. Hardly worth all this trouble to come and look at it. Shall we go? Oh, what a philistine you are, Bunny. Oh, by Jove, it's, it's magnificent. Oh. What do you think? Could we lift it? You better hadn't try, sir. Good God! How could we have missed sighting this portly, red-faced constable? Well, well, I'm very glad to see they've got a proper policeman to guard it. Going to run me in, officer? I didn't say I was, sir. 
But that's a queer way for a gentleman like yourself to be talking. What, for saying to my friend that I should like to run off with the gold cup? Why, I don't mind who hears me say it, officer. It's one of the most beautiful things I ever saw in my life. Well, I dare say there's a good many as feels like that, sir. Exactly. But seriously, officer, is something as valuable as this quite safe in a case like that? Safe enough as long as I'm here. But you appear to be single-handed. Is that wise? I'm not single-handed. See that seat by the door? One of the attendants sits there all day long. Well, where is he now, pray? Only just down the corridor. A national treasure ought to be guarded better than this. Why, you haven't even got a truncheon. Now, I shall write to the Times about this. Lord bless you, sir, I'm all right. This here room would be filled up with people in no time. And their safety in numbers, they say. Oh, it'll fill up soon, will it? Uh, another ten minutes at the most, sir. We don't usually get them up here till about half past. It's all them stairs. Well, I shall write to the Times all the same. You say the attendant's just outside, but it, it sounds to me as though he's at the other end of the corridor. He cocked his head, and for a moment we all three listened. We could just hear the murmur of voices, but a good distance off. Raffles' public-spirited indignation was visibly increasing. No, it won't do. It really won't do. What if my friend and I actually were professional thieves? Why, we could overpower you in an instant. That you couldn't. Oh, you think not? Well, perhaps I can persuade you differently. <clears throat> what have you done? Knocked him out, I hope. Now, quick, run to the door, see if those attendants are coming. Mechanically, I obeyed him. But even in my bewilderment, the instinctive caution of the real criminal did not desert me. I ran to the door, but sauntered out into the corridor. I planted myself in front of a Pompeian fresco. There were the two attendants still gossiping at the end of the corridor. It was hot weather, but the perspiration on my body seemed to have turned into a skin of ice. It was only when Raffles strolled out to join me that anger brought me back to life. A single glance showed me he was completely empty-handed. This wanton, reckless act had been for nothing. Interesting collection, but nothing to what they have in the Museum of Naples. Shall we go? He took my arm and, cool as you please, moved off in the very direction of the two attendants. Slow march, Bunny. The fat constable hasn't moved an eyelid. I hope he's still alive, but we don't want to swing for him by showing indecent haste. Oui. 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 Getting all the foreigners. I mean, London's crawling with them, but I ain't never Excuse seen Excuse me. Oh. Yes, sir? A prehistoric art? I doubt the stairs and round to your left, sir. Thanks so much. I believe you're mad. Steady, Bunny, for God's sake. It's slow march for our lives. And pray for a cab when we get out of here. It wasn't until we got rid of the porter and were alone in his apartment that I told Raffles frankly and exactly what I thought of this latest deed. He stood my abuse without a murmur, too astounded even to take off his hat. It has always been your infernal way. You make one plan for yourself, tell me another just to keep me quiet, and then you... Not thought... today, Bunny, I swear. You said reconnoiter. Absolutely my only intention. Then why, why, why go and do what you did? Why on earth risk being run in for nothing? But I should have deserved running in if I hadn't yielded to that temptation, Bunny. Oh, what a chance in a hundred thousand. We might go there every day of our lives and never again be the only outsiders in that room with one guard and the other side of earshot. Oh. It was a gift from the gods. Not to have taken it would have been flying in the face of providence. But you didn't take it. You went and left it behind. Bunny. I had seen that little smile with which Raffles now shook his head once or twice in the past. All this time he had been wearing... Your hat! My hat, Bunny. And our cup. For ten days that confounded gold cup sat on the chimney-piece to be adored by Raffles, while newspaper columns were filled with shocked stories about its fate. Once we had learned that our constable had only been stunned, Raffles' spirits rose to new heights. Look at it. Only look at it, man. Was ever anything so rich and yet so delicate? Oh, and the history of the thing. Do you realise it's 500 years old? 
once belonged to Henry VIII. What I realise is that it represents considerable danger for us both being here at all, and that the gold in it would scarcely pour three figures out of the melting pot. Good God, Bunny, what are you suggesting? Taking it was an offence against the law, but destroying it will be a crime against God and art. <sighs> when you have me cremated, you can put my ashes in that cup and have us buried together. And meanwhile? Meanwhile? It's the joy of my heart and the delight of mine eye. And suppose other eyes catch sight of it? Well, they never must. They never shall. It was quite bootless talking to him in this mood. I continued sending off my weekly telegram of report to Dr. Theobald as ordered, the composition of which gave Raffles much pleasure. And I must regretfully report that Mr. Maturin's temper grows worse daily. <laughs> this week alone, he has shattered... Um... Several soup plates, two thermometers, and a pudding bowl. <laughs> By the way, Bunny, I've had an idea after your own heart. I know now where I can place the cup. Then I congratulate you. Thank you. On the recovery of your senses. You've been so confoundedly unsympathetic about this thing, Bunny, that I don't think I shall tell you my scheme. I assure you I haven't the least wish to know it. However, it will mean you're occupying the porter this very afternoon. Huh? Twice. Once when I go out... And once, about an hour and a half later, when I return. This afternoon? Yes. Tomorrow's Sunday, and the Jubilee's on Tuesday, and Theobald's coming back for it. But why not go after dark? Because it must be before six. One more thing. Yes. Will you go out immediately and buy me a tin of Huntley and Palmer biscuits? Biscuits? Biscuits. The largest tin they have, mind. Obviously, I was to be treated like a child. I quietly carried out my ludicrous errand, and then at half-past four engaged the attention of the porter as instructed. That night the cup was gone. Don't you want to know how much I got for it, Bunny? Not really, no. Nothing. Not a crimson cent. I never thought it had a market value. I told you so in the beginning. As a matter of fact, I had to pay them to take it. Oh, doesn't surprise me in the least. And that was the last mention we made of the subject until Monday morning, when Dr. Theobald returned. Have you seen this in the paper, Mr. Maturin? I don't know, do I, till you tell me what it is? It's about that gold cup that was stolen from the British yes? Museum. What about it? They've got it back. What are you talking about, got it back? A Scotland Yard, you mean? But, but how? Hang on there, Manchester, just calm down. He's wild about antiques, this fella. Uh -huh. Been worried sick about that cup. What's the story, Doctor? It was posted to Park Lane, to the Queen's Equerry, Sir Arthur Big, in a biscuit tin. Good God, quite. It had a note in it from the audacious villain who'd taken it. A note? Printed on a postcard. It just said, oh, uh, uh, let's see, uh, uh, ah, with the loyal respects of the thief for Her Majesty on her diamond jubilee. Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> What the devil's up with you, Manchester? You find that funny, do you? Yes, I do. What a sportsman! Sportsman? A common thief? Well, not all that common. Sir? I entirely agree with you, Mr. Maturin. The man's nothing but a flashy blackguard. In my view... When I want your views, I'll ask for them. Uh, yes, Mr. Maturin. That evening I went out to a tobacconist and smuggled in a box of Sullivans. We filled our glasses with the whiskey, which was concealed by day under my mattress, and lit up our cigarettes. The Queen. The Queen. God, God bless her. In No Sinecure by E. W. Hornung, dramatised for radio by Olwyn Wymark, Jeremy Clyde was A. J. Raffles, and Michael Cochran, Barney Manders. Gordon Reed played Dr. Theobald, John Hartley, Mr. Maturin, John Church, the constable, Keith Drinkle, the landlord, and John Webb, the porter. Other parts were played by Henry Stamper, Frederick Yeager, and members of the cast. 
The Raffles theme music was composed by Jim Parker, the sound balance was by Keith Perrin, and the production was by Gordon House.